All right, I'm delighted to say that Katrina Jennings and Lizzie Lee join me in studio alongside Sue Murphy from Off the Bench. You're very welcome along. Thanks very much. So we're promoting uh, the SSE Electricity Dublin Marathon. And before I came on air, I just said we're going to start talking about a marathon and how somebody like me who's never done even a 5 or 10k run uh, could potentially get ready for this year's marathon. And the looks I was getting potentially <laughs> suggests that I should forget about this year. <laughs> I think 2019 would be a better, right, okay. more realistic I'll, option. I'll put it in the diary straight away. So, so what base do you need to be at to actually do a marathon? Because it's what, the, the bank holiday weekend always uh, at the end of October. So five and a half months away, where do you need to be at at this point to successfully run a marathon? I think if you're comfortably running 5 to 10k at the moment, um, and maybe if you're comfortably running, say, three to four times a week, and you know, you're, getting, you're getting out consistently and... Uh, you don't have to be running terribly long distances yet, but as long as you're comfortable running 5 to 10k, uh, it's really more middle of June to start of July that you need to start ramping up your distance and time running, uh, you know, if you were trying to do, do a reasonably good marathon this year. Okay, so it's a polite reminder basically for people that now's the time to start thinking about getting yourself back in action a little bit. Yeah, definitely, yeah. So, so what do you do at this point then? So say if you are a 5 or 10k runner, so you're pretty accustomed to those sorts of distances. Is it a matter of just endurance, endurance, endurance? How do you make that less arduous uh, or, or, or kind of a, like a less onerous five months? Because it is a long time. What I would do personally is I, I'd meet a group. I'd get training partners. There are people in every county in the whole of Ireland training for marathons. Find somebody. It can just be one person. It can be a gang. I did 20 miles yesterday um, with one guy. Um, it, just as long as you have somebody, it makes it easier. And it doesn't have to be for all the runs, but some of them, it definitely makes it easier if you've got somebody. And it'll get you out the door. If you've arranged to meet somebody, you'll go out the door and you'll do it. There is a little bit of speed work. So that's where you're picking it up and probably doing something like an interval session or a fart um, but the, the core of your marathon run is going to be your long run usually typically on a Sunday because that usually works around people's schedules mm. um, so you're building up usually kind of by 5 or 10% week on week to build up to the long run so that you know on race day you're, n you're never going to run 26 miles well most people won't <laughs> in a training run but you might hit the 20 at least once or twice so it's building up to that long run on a Sunday is really the core of your marathon training Does that make it more difficult then if you say if you're training with somebody and you know you're going into that race by yourself what kind of mental state do you need but there's to be thousands on the start line yeah, you know true, so well. you you'll be the chances are in dublin you're going to be surrounded by people mm, yeah. all aiming for a time in and around you um sure. and there's usually a conversation on the start yeah. line even dublin's at our level there's dublin's brilliant and even if you're not um you know even if you're not if you don't know the athletes what we would usually know the athletes we're competing against yeah. but if you're further back the field dublin is actually known as the friendly marathon because people can um actually meet up along the way and start chatting about you know the running that they're doing and the time that they're going for and you have a number of conversations throughout so it actually makes the the, t the miles pass easier so it's interesting the first thing you mentioned there when i asked you about what is the first tip it's find a group because we were having this conversation soon before uh, we, we started recording here and it was about the idea of the solitary sport and how that must be one of the difficulties for an athlete but then the more you think about it for maybe it's just me but i'm starting to think actually is that not one of the positives of being in your sport it's like you're dealing with people all day some people are very very annoying and you get to get away from that and be by yourself in Easy the evenings quiet. Maybe it depends. I mean, I know myself, I train a lot at lunchtime because it's the, it, it suits me best during the, you know, to fit it into my work schedule. And uh, if I have to work late in the evening, um, you know, it means that I have my run done if I go at lunchtime. And also I meet some people um, to do a, a speed session during the week on a Tuesday, which, which helps with the training as well. Um, I think there's, there's days when you want company and there's days when you just want to be on your own. Um, and I think both are great. Uh, I, I think maybe sometimes when you're, you're running on your own at lunchtime, if you've got, if you had a problem in work that morning, if you're trying to figure something out, um, you know, it, you'll always have it figured out or, mm. you know, have a, have a solution at the end. It's just, uh, it's a way of processing thoughts as well. So it's really nice when you're on your own. But again, when you're with, with someone, it kind of makes it easier to get out the door. What's the competitive kind of standard? Is there a standard there or is it each athlete to their own when they're training for an event? Well, like, say if I'm training for a marathon, I'll, there's a group of lads in Cork who'll be in and around the same speed as me over a marathon and we'll all train together um, and we'll all help each other. There is only competition on the start line of a marathon. There's no winners in training. Mm. So there's, like, we'll all help each other all the way. Uh, you know, there's no one racing anybody in a training session. It's all just about getting a steady 
decent effort done. Um, and there's a huge camaraderie. It's an individual sport, which I love, but it also, there is a team element and there's, for me personally, like I wouldn't have gone to Rio had it not been for the Leeville lads. Um, you know, there's just no way because they helped me with so many of the hard sessions and the long runs. You can fill in the other bits between on your own pretty easily and I like doing that but when it comes to the really hard graft give me a set of heels and I'll just chase them and that's that for me that's that's what works uh, and what, what do you mean by the help they're giving you is it heels it, oh right okay <laughs> I see fair enough so on a Saturday morning so I'll just give you Saturday morning gone just for example we did three by ten minutes of hard work with two minutes um, rest in between um, and I did it with a group of about five or six lads. Um, I led one of the reps and then two other guys led um, the other ones. And we just all worked together as a unit. There was, we were running up a big hill. There was, all of us worked together in a group. And it just makes it so much easier if you're, you're working with people. And it's the exact same at every level you're talking about in the marathon. I've just recently coached my brother from nothing to a 22 minute um, park run on a Saturday morning, which right, I was okay. thrilled with. Pretty good. But he's now meeting the lads on a Tuesday night for a five mile run and he's just getting such a buzz out of it because, you know, they meet up and they have the chat and then they all go home to the kids after work. And, you know, it's just uh, the camaraderie through running. It's brilliant. You yeah, know? That, like that's the key thing. I mean, like we'll get into the highly competitive element again in, in just a moment. But I know, Sue, you were mentioning about kind of team sports and how the accessibility and actually getting active as a result of this, because it is a very accessible sport. The top end is very daunting, but at the at the lower end, it is accessible. And Ireland is one of the greatest countries for doing this sort of activity. And and you were saying that team sports do kind of differ in terms of your your ability to get into them. Particularly, there's a difference between uh, men and women in that regard. Yeah, and I think there was a, a report a couple of years ago that basically said that women tend to get out and do a run by themselves and don't really get involved in team sport as much as men do. And that's what I was wondering about getting involved in the marathon because I think I run. Um, but I don't run in races. I always feel like I'm not going to be able to compete. I'm not as good as everyone else that would be there. And I think there is a bit of a mentality around that where I think of a race, you have something to go work towards. And there is a bit of a team sport element. I, I just think men kind of gravitate towards that a bit more. But women definitely seem to get out and do things by themselves a bit more. I, I don't know if that's... I think that's where you should probably use like the double marathon race yeah. series. And you've got the stepping stones up to the marathon and each time you do it you'll meet more and more people and you'll realise it's like the first time you run for Ireland you think you're going to be last mm. and lo and behold you're not la you know what I mean so it's just about um, realising that there are plenty other men and women yeah. at the same level as you putting in the same effort and enjoying it just as much yeah. and all of a sudden you'll realise that there is this community out there that you can tap into and that you can make friends through and that you can use to help you with your training I definitely think because the park run takes place down the road for me every week. I'll actually go out after the park run to do my run because I'm like, I won't be able to keep up with these oh, people. So well, there's but people there's will so walk it with buggies. Yeah, 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 no, it's, it's just, and that, that is, I think some women just treat it as being a kind of a solitary thing, whereas if you get them involved and put them in races and stuff, it just brings more of a team. Guarantee if you went to one, you'd never yeah, come back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and especially with the park run, it's a great way to get out. It's a, you know, it's a nice early start on a Saturday yeah. morning. Yeah, and if you do a few of them, you can just try and beat your own time every week. You don't have to be thinking about what time other Absolutely. people are running. It's just a matter of beating your previous best. And, yeah. You know, it's a good training stepping stone exactly, for doing something yeah, like this. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So start off with the park run and uh, build your way up to the race series <laughs> on the Dublin Marathon. I use the park run for training when I'm away for the weekend. Yeah. Yeah. I'll hop into the, whatever local park run is on because it gives me a good... Yeah, it's you know, amazing. 15, uh, 16 yeah. minute, uh, really good effort, honest, and you get to meet people and there's usually coffee and stuff afterwards. Yeah. And it's just really good community vibe. Mm. And are people not thinking, this is an Olympian in our midst, we've, we've got to really up our game here, we're not <laughs> going to be able to handle it. I tried to break the Irish record in Westport and it was really windy and I missed it by five oh, seconds. No. Yeah, it was really hilly. And the whole of Westport knew I was trying to break the record. Um, but then we all went for coffee and it was lovely. Um, but that's that's a good buzz too because yeah. there's, I, mean, I signed autographs that day in Westport sport you know for little girls that's pretty cool. and that that to me that's what it's all about if I can motivate one little girl Absolutely, to yeah. get out there and and th uh, she doesn't necessarily have to run she can just be sporty then that's that's to me that's the job done you know that's something we were talking about as well actually is that on a junior level I know you guys got involved later like what can we be doing to get younger girls involved I know that but well, you didn't compete at junior level at all was it, it was I later. actually competed in triathlon at junior level yeah. um and then kind of through, through college and through moving to Dublin to start working. Triathlon was just a, a huge commitment time-wise for training, so I sure. got more involved in, in, in running itself. 
But I think at a junior level, I think it's really important to not just think about running. You need to just experiment in all sports because um, I think even some of the most successful athletes didn't actually specialise in their sport until they got a bit older. I suppose bar the few golfers or, you know, tennis players that you read about. But um, I think it's really important to make sport fun and to, to get involved in as much, as many varied and different sports as you can. And then you'll always gravitate towards the one that you enjoy the most anyway. So Absolutely, yeah. I suppose for us that was running, but, you know, for someone else it might be something completely different. And, sure. and I think, um, you know, that is the beauty of team sport, that it can be fun, especially at a young age when you don't want to be too, you know, serious about it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, so like... That's the terms of participation, but I guess when it gets to your level and the stuff that you've achieved throughout your career, you start to think about medals, you start to think about how can we turn our elite performers into people that we can put up in posters around the country and turn into gold, silver or bronze medals. That is essentially what the cynic in all of us thinks, what the sport fan in all of us thinks. And like when you start thinking about that, like I was going to ask you about Paula Radcliffe because it's 15 years on since she broke uh, her world record, the one that still stands. Mm -hmm. And just doing a little bit more reading about it, she was saying that when she was 17 years old, she got pulled aside by a coach and was like, your VO2 max is off the charts. You have to become a marathon runner. And I'm wondering, and I, I know this is quite a cynical thing because participation should be the most important thing, for our teenagers in Ireland who are showing a bit of promise at a young age, no matter what sport it is, that they have the, the physiological data in front of them to say, actually, do you know what? You're a sprinter. That's what you're doing. But you should actually think about more endurance because I've got your VO2 figures in front of me and you can be outstanding. I fully agree with, um, you know, pulling people, well, not necessarily pulling them aside, but identifying talent and, um, you know, nurturing that talent. Uh, I like I agree it's fantastic to have mass participation but at the end of the day people really do want to see Irish athletes achieve as well and I think you do have to start nurturing that at a you know at a teenage age and um, particularly for girls we were talking earlier about how there's a huge rate of attrition for girls through their teenage years and you know I think if um, if they were identified as being potential stars of the future at that point and really encouraged and you know, if they can see the results as they as they progress, I think that would be a huge reason for them to stay mm. and to stay in the sport. So I think it goes for pretty much all Olympic sport, doesn't it? Because naturally, most of them are niche sports. I mean, people will naturally play team sports; they will always dominate. But there will be people who play team sports who won't achieve at the highest level of team sports because of a lack of skill. But there is going to be natural physiological data. What, what did you play actually? Everything. Yeah. <laughs> Quite badly. <laughs> uh, I was the utility player because I was always fit and I could run around the pitch. But I had <laughs> almost no skill. Well, um, rugby, basketball, I everything. I played, I'm, you name it, a lot of basketball, a lot of soccer. We were a soccer school, um, Bishop Sound Community School. Um, I, I played everything. I did water polo in college. Was never brilliant at everything, but I just liked it. I mm. just, and then once I found the running, I, that was my passion. And it was what just... What was your encouragement away. around that? Because we were talking before about PE and PE in schools and not enough PE. girls continuing. Loved it. Where did you think the breakdown is with girls not continuing we, into... We had a brilliant PE teacher who it, was it just, just so inclusive. Yeah. And we had a really good girls soccer team that he built up. We won monster titles and things. Mm. Um, and he built it up and it was within the school. It was just normal for a girl to play soccer and basketball. Yeah. And even you talk about identifying talent. Okay, I wasn't utter rubbish. Yeah. Um, I was pulled aside and brought to a, a club team at one point um, because I was doing well in the school team. And it's, you know, there is a fostering and a nurturing there within the yeah. Yeah. coaching um, and I think it's it's about making it normal for girls to play sport Absolutely, and yeah. making it acceptable um, and that will only happen by other girls playing sport you know yeah. what I mean um, and I go around to schools um, and I go around to them when they're young to try and instill this try everything make it fun sport is good sport is only going to be positive for your life you mm. know and it's important they see you having and that conversation they, yeah, as well. yeah you know and I'm fine I mightn't be winning the Olympics but if I can motivate a few little girls down in Skulls Brunev in Cork then I'm going to yeah. do that you know what I mean and then maybe they're going to win the Olympics you know what I mean but that's that's what it's about to me and when you go to these schools do you get a sense that these are schools that are equipped to kind of uh, prioritise participation? Do you feel that the physical education set up in, in these schools is where it should be? I'm usually asked by the schools that are all over their sport because that's why they've contacted sure, that's me. Good point, yeah. Yeah. Say, I mean, yeah, it's always the schools that are really, the teacher is always really enthusiastic mm. and yeah. wants to bring someone in to kind of encourage people, but they're already encouraged because the teacher is the so teacher, enthusiastic. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess it's even back to the point that you made that it's because your PE teacher was so enthusiastic. You know? Brilliant, you know? Um, 
But, and, it, and it is at school, but it's also at home as well. I think yeah. parents are enthusiastic and kids see their yeah, parents going either. out running. Or I know for myself, my parents were constantly out. And my dad was cycling or my mum was out playing golf. Like our house, we were Your never at family, home. whole family, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think it's just, um, it's just what kids see becomes the norm yeah. and then they just get involved. Sure. Yeah. I always say lunchtime in our house on a Sunday was at tea time, it was at six o'clock on a Sunday because there was nobody to be had at lunchtime on a Sunday. <laughs> my dad is 68 and he still cycles 150 miles a week. You know, like it, it was just, it's yeah. just normal. And when it's, when it's like that and you're growing up, well, you have to do something because sure. otherwise you become on your own. For, for those that don't uh, have a 68 year old cycling uh, around the <laughs> country uh, every weekend, like the school then plays a hugely yes. important part in all of this. And there is a sense that it's as simple as variety sometimes in these classes, certainly like okay I went to an all boys school but it was always like oh, let's just play indoor soccer every week but like I presume that that problem would be more prevalent in a mixed school for sure because there is no variety you don't appeal to everybody's taste I mean you've got two, two genders instead of one there's a bro broader spectrum naturally that way so is it as simple as that or is it actually just the, the education of the teachers perhaps that, that they're not equipped to actually physically educate or is it as I say just variety the variety of sports on offer in, in PE well, it's probably a mixture because, firstly, the school probably needs a certain amount of funding to have the facilities. Yeah. So maybe you played indoor soccer because there, there wasn't um, outdoor soccer pitches available. I'm not sure, but, you know... There was. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there goes that brain. <laughs> but um, I think, so it does... Well, I mean, you need to have a, a pretty good standard of facilities there to start with. but And you also then need the teachers to, to back that up and to, you know, to support it. And I know in the school I went to, and again, I played all of, um, sorts of uh, school or sports in school, but... Um, most of it was actually by teachers volunteering after hours, yeah. mm -hmm. like, you know, between badminton, volleyball, uh, you know, camogie. It was all teachers just volunteering that extra hour or two after school. And I think that's really important. But it's a big ask of the teachers as well. So, you know, I suppose it's not really fair to just assume that you know, that, that they do that. But maybe it's to incentivise teachers to kind of become more involved and to, to facilitate those those classes and, and, and those parents, as well. I have every intention of coaching. Mm. When my Irish single days are, are gone, I will be down the Leeville track um, and I will be coaching. Um, so, you know, I, the, when my kids are a little bit bigger because I won't have the time now, but when I'm a bit, a little bit more time rich, I definitely plan on coaching. So it's about giving back, but it's also about normalizing it. You know, I have a 13 year old niece. Um, and I've seen, you know, her go into secondary school and she's playing hockey and she's good at hockey and that's brilliant. But some of her friends aren't playing any sports um, and, and that's okay with everybody. And it's about normalising it and how do you make it cool? Mm. Yeah. That's really it for, for the teenagers. Yeah. How do you make it cool and normal to be playing sports? So that's what everybody, it's every part of the teenager's life has to be making sport normal. Their parents, it's not just back down to schools. You can't leave everything, lump everything sure. with the mm. school. Yeah. You know, and even a community, even just going, I mean, if you live near CIT in Cork, you go down and you train with one of the, the athletics clubs um, and like non-running families, they all go because it's just normal because sure everyone's going and everyone in the class is going and then there's this kind of yeah. snowball effect so it just has to be about everybody in a child's life making sure that they're participating. Yeah like I guess when you, when you take that into account and you mentioned facilities there and kind of different sports that are available to people because they live beside a pitch or they live in the country so there's naturally a lot of fields and stuff it does come back to the sport that we're here to talk about and it is to long distance running and I guess no matter where you are in the world it is the one thing where everybody's on a level playing field so where do you feel Ireland is at in terms of the future of long distance running? Do you feel we're in a good place to keep producing top quality runners? Because we have performed well, like we have performed, I would say we have punched above our weight when we compare ourselves to the other Olympic sports, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. um, like is that improving, do you feel? Is, is there a new generation coming through that, that are set, o set to take over for me in a couple of years' time and actually represent Ireland in the Olympics and represent us very well? I think there's a huge group of, of young uh, athletes coming through and you'll even have seen that in the last Olympics that some, some, some of the younger guys actually probably performed you know, above what was expected from them. Mm. Um, there's, a, there's a big group of girls coming through as well and um, you know, I think while maybe the marathon isn't something that they've tackled quite yet, um, it's something they will get to because um, you know, I suppose it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a, a matter of building your base before you get to, that, to the marathon level. But, um, I, as you said, it's so accessible. Anyone can can run. Anyone can, um, especially for long distance. You throw on your runners and you head out the door, and that's it. So, um, I do think that uh, that there will be plenty coming through in the future, and there's lots of stars there. 
Yeah, for sure. Like, I, I'm not sure, am I reading this into kind of the Irish psyche too much, but I think there is something kind of suited to the Irish profile about marathon running, about endurance sports, because we've, got, we've gone on a, on a wild tangent here. We weren't planning on chatting about half the stuff we were chatting about this <laughs> afternoon, but the other thing I, I did want to, to ask you about was um, just about endurance sport, because in Tyler Hamilton's book, and I know like Tyler Hamilton is a doper and all that sort of stuff, but the reason why he was such a successful cyclist in the first place was because of his love for endurance sport, and he always said, and it was the passage from his book that I always remember, he said that he used to love the feeling of meeting the wall and absolutely crushing the wall. He used to actually really love that moment when he knew he was at the very end of his tether and that it was him versus the other guy and his uh, mental will would always beat the guy beside him. And that's why he got to the position where he was, where Lance Armstrong took him under his wing eventually. Like, do, do you feel that that's a thing that we have in this country, that there's a lot of mentally strong people, but also... Is that the most important thing? Like, w once you've been identified as a potential contender on a physical level, that it is a game of wits. Well, you're you're not going to be any good at a marathon if you don't have it mentally in racing capacity. So you could be the most talented on a VO2 max through the roof, mm. but if you can't race, um, you know you're going to be at nothing. And then the flip side of that is, you know, you can have all the mental will in the world but you need a bit of talent so um, I think it's a combination of both the marathon is incredibly mental um, I did 20 miler yesterday and about 18 started to get really tired and I upped the pace Okay. because I wanted to get home and my head was determined to not let myself fade and whatever and that's kind of a, a mental thing that you can't kind of teach it just has to come I think um, one of the reasons the endurance sports f suits us here is because we have mild winters I was only on a treadmill two or three days during the, the big storm this winter so yes it rains but you can go out and run in the rain so that's important so we have sure. a nice climate we're never too hot and we're never really too cold so that's conducive to it as well and then you can get these big groups to, to train with and um, like the mental part of marathon is, I can you know, it, you can you can't experience it until you've experienced it. From yeah. twenty two to twenty six in a marathon is unlike anything you'll ever experience, um, and it can be hell, but also it makes the finish line even better. Of and I think it. I think we're tough. I think Irish people are tough mm. um, because we, you know, especially when you go out and you train all winter in the cold and the rain, and um, then you get to the start line of Dublin and it's a nice day and you're like, oh, bring it, come on, I've done my training, I've done it. And we're, you know, we're hardy, I think, yeah. personally. Like you mentioned there, you can't actually teach that in terms of uh, your mental relationship. You can with, improve with it. That's it. That's exactly what I was going to Like, how, how do you improve it? It's obviously a self-taught thing. Yeah. Experience. Experience, probably, yeah. yeah. Now, you can, I mean, I read a lot of books, um, a lot of uh, sports biographies, a lot of them, um, and I take little nuggets from each one I read. There'll always be some, like you had a passage there about Tyler, like there's always, uh, there's a Michael Phelps passage, which I always remember, where he was a small boy and he didn't want to go training and his coach didn't let him and he let him sit on the side and he had to watch the training session and at the end, halfway through, he was like, oh no, I want to get in the pool. He's like, no, no, he's going to beat you in the next gala because you didn't want to train today. And I always remember that. So I always think of the girls in Dublin when I'm in Cork and it's raining <laughs> and I don't want to go out and I'm like, well, if I want to beat the girls in Dublin, I'm going to have to go out today because they're going out. <laughs> you know, so there's little tricks that you use that you can, you can take nuggets from people but at the end of the day you, you, you either want to win or you don't and yeah but maybe that's why you know you do get be better at marathons with time yes, as well the like experience it is the experience of having gone through it and knowing that you can do it and then knowing that you can build on that and you can actually endure and you can suffer more than you thought you could mm. and I think that's maybe why you continue to progress as you get older as you run more marathons you kind of become wiser and you, you know you can sustain the pain for <laughs> because it is painful but it's, it's a nice pain it, it's a it's a it's a, it is a it's a, like a challenge you set, set yourself and then as, as you said when you get to the, the finish line then it makes it all sweeter yeah for sure like like so you mentioned the, the first ever off the bench interview which was with yourself Katrina and I think that kind of uh, definitely triggers that interview it just kind of talking about your leg that day and if you want to actually tell the story because this was I, I would say about three years ago now when, when this interview was done because and a lot of a lot of our viewers wouldn't have actually seen this interview like if you wouldn't mind just even, even paraphrasing the story of, of that day in London yeah so um, I guess I was preparing for the, the London Marathon dream come true um, I made it to the Olympics and uh, you know because obviously it was going to be the the biggest race of my life I was training to the very maximum of my capabilities and uh, as all marathon runners will tell you, um, there is a knife edge when you're training for a marathon and preparing for a marathon. It's very hard not to go over that. Unfortunately, I did, um, you know, in the lead up to London. But 
in saying that, you know, I suppose the morning of the race, I still felt that I had a you know pretty good, um, pretty good shot at doing well that day. I knew that I would probably end up coming out of it injured, but you know, I, I thought that I'd you know have a, have a pretty good race, um, you know, when I was there. Um, but unfortunately, things didn't quite turn out that way, and. Um, I ended up um, actually sustaining a, a stress fracture of my fifth metatarsal in my foot um, throughout the race and meant that I, you know, hobbled home in last place, which was pretty upsetting given that it was, you know, effectively um, the worst race of my life on the biggest stage of my life. Um, so I guess, you know, I find that really difficult to deal with and, um, you know, it was extremely traumatic. But um, there, when I look back now, I suppose there are positives that I can take from it. And I suppose one of the one of the main positives really was the crowd that day and how, you know, everyone stayed to, to the very end. Like no matter what athlete they were sporting, they were still there to the very last minute that I crossed the finish line. And um, I suppose it showed the will of people that, you know, that, they w they were willing me over the line that they really did want want me to get there and uh, um, I guess personally it was it was traumatic and it w it wasn't the race I'd hoped for but um, I guess maybe it's just a an analogy of life as well like mm. sometimes no matter how well prepared you are it doesn't really turn out the way you'd hoped and it's just something you have to try and deal with and, and move on you know can I just say Katrina actually came in for that interview and it was meant to be about 15-20 minutes and she talked for an hour <laughs> and we didn't even interrupt her she just sat there and talked and it was an amazing piece because your determination was unbelievable I don't know how you managed to get through a race with an injury like that to, like willing yourself forward for such a long time it was an incredible interview and just an incredible achievement Thanks. Really was. Well, you should get that piece back up uh, on the yeah. website. We'll stick it up and off the ball. Check out our social channels in a while. Uh, like that's a completely obviously. You talk about pain, and that's just different layers of pain, isn't it? It's completely. It's not just mental and physical. It's emotional at that emotional. point, isn't it? Actually, it was mainly emotional. <laughs> that was the worst, really, yeah. because you know we're all used to physical pain and yeah. uh, and um, even the mental pain of running a marathon. But it was the emotional pain of actually not really being able to kind of. Um, process that you know this is the Olympics and this is happening and it's happening right now and you know you, there's in a way it was great because there was so many people there to support but it, it, there was part of me that was kind of wishing everyone would just, <laughs> just go, go away. away. <laughs> <laughs> the great quote from that as well was um, I felt like I was letting my country down and that was I found that really upsetting because you were doing it so proud and it was in your head you were thinking totally differently. I suppose when you're wearing the Irish vest you always want to be you want it to be the best performance or certainly the best that you're capable of on the day and yeah. I yeah I, I really didn't feel like it was anywhere near that and I you know I knew myself on the lead up to it that I was in excellent shape I was in the shape of my life and then to just not be able to you know, actually produce that mm -hmm. on the day is is difficult. It's you know, yeah. but um, I suppose that's the that is the beauty of the marathon as well. That it's it is a knife edge that you're running, and um, it, when it get when you get it right, it's just amazing. Um, it's and you know that it could go so many different ways. That when it goes right, it it does give you an amazing sense of satisfaction. And with the Dublin marathon, I guess you know. Um, I said earlier on that you know it's a, it's it's known as the friendly marathon and people you know chat throughout the race and that but um, the support is amazing it really is a fantastic run to do and I think a, a lot of the time that support that you get kind of you know maybe quietens the, the voices in your head and mm. you know gets you there yeah absolutely so you you went rowing for a while you're back in the roads now are you I am yes yeah so what what's the what's the next step then. Um, I think I'd like to do Dublin Marathon again this year. Okay. As I said, I do love Dublin. Uh, it's a great race and uh, it's organised so well and the support is fantastic. And it's a nice goal to have as well at this time of the year because it's, you know, far enough out that you can still prepare very well for it. But, um, you know, you do have the time, you know, at the same time. So um, I think uh, that'll probably be next for me. Sure. And then Lizzie, it's Berlin in August? 12th of August, 12 weeks and six days. Right. My next marathon. That, that sounds like somebody who's yeah. training and has a thing. He is trying to kill me. <laughs> they are trying to kill me. Joe Connor and Donny Walsh. Um, yeah, uh, training hard. Just started about two weeks ago. Like, not started training, but really upped the ante about two weeks ago. Um, I'm going to 14 week, really tough block. Um, because I had the baby in June last year. I haven't got the long, long runs done because I had to build back up. Um, so I'm just, I'm only just three weeks ago back at my first 20 miler. 
so I've got work to do. Uh, it's coming, it's, it's coming, but it's just it's a slog. I'm sure the, the 12 week road looks like a very long one, so I apologise in advance for bringing this up, but <laughs> has the word Tokyo been inserted into the discourse at the moment? No, I think, I, I, so I'm going to say at my age, I'm, I'm 37, I'm going to be 38 in a few weeks. Um, I'm just taking it one championship at a time. I'm only thinking about the green vest on the 12th of August. Um, that might sound twee or that I'm dodging the question. I'm not. I'm just taking this block um, and I'll get try and get the best out of myself. I want to be on the start line of Berlin in PB shape. Um, and that's all I'm thinking about. And then you hopefully that I can use that training as a building block for something else. But I'll think about that after the 12th of August. Actually, probably after the 1st of September. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> after I've eaten all the pies. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, that's, that's really what I'm thinking about. I think at, uh, at now, at this stage of my career, I'm just thinking about it championship for championship. Certainly, I, I tried to qualify for London the same day as Katrina actually qualified. We went through, I'd say, about five or six miles together. Um, and then she ran off into the distance and I finished 10 minutes behind her. So I decided that day I was going to try for Rio. So it's been a long, long road to get to Rio. And then there, so there was a baby in between Rotterdam and Rio and now there's another baby. So life is a bit busier and stuff. So, but I still, like every time you put on the Irish vest, it's special. Like, it's just something else. So I'll just get the most out of myself in August and I'll see from there. Well, the very best of luck with the next 12 weeks. Uh, Katrina Jennings, Lizzie Lee, thank you so much for coming in. It was fascinating spending some time in your company. It is the 28th of October, the SSC Electricity Marathon. So get training now if you've done a 5 or 10k in your lifetime now. If you're like me, <laughs> let's, uh, let's do 2019 together. Uh, Katrina and Lizzie, thank you very much. Thank Be you. Thank you. Thank you.